Hey everyone, it's Ron Johnson, and this is the Ron Johnson Show on Locked On Sports Minnesota. Got to talk about the Timberwolves. They are now in the hunt. They are in the playoffs. No play-in, six games to go. But there's some about this bench, and there's also some about who they might have to play that we have to break down. Could it be the five seed? Could it be the four seed? Or would you rather play the three seed? We'll talk about that next, coming up on the Ron Johnson Show. Locked On Sports Minnesota Podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. Now the Ron Johnson Show. On the field, in the broadcast booth, Ron Johnson is Minnesota sports. He's played with them, hung out with them, and grown up with all the big names in Minnesota sports. They're hanging out with Ron Johnson. It's the Ron Johnson Show on the Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast. And it starts now. Hey everyone, it's Ron Johnson and this is the Ron Johnson Show on Locked On Sports Minnesota's podcast network. I want you to remember this episode is powered by and brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sports book of Locked On. Just go to fanduel.com backslash locked on to get started today. And of course, these parlays are coming up, people. You don't want to miss the final four parlays because I know, I know your brackets are busted. There's no way you pick San Diego State and FAU in the final four. So do like I'm doing and have some fun with these parlays. Well, coming up on the show, we are have to talk about the Timberwolves. This is a team now that's giving some people some hope in the state of Minnesota, some true hope right now. We also have Deshaun Foster coming up, former UCLA running back, draft pick of the Carolina Panthers. Super Bowl participant Sam and I sit down with him in the daily three, and then also he's going to join me in the hang with Ron Johnson segment. As I bring Sam Exerman to the show, my producer Sam, I am I don't know what to do with the Timberwolves right now. I'm gonna be honest. Like at one point, I was done with them at the beginning of the year, I was super excited about them, then I lost faith. Now I'm back in it. Like again, it's this roller coaster that I, I don't know where this ride's going, but they're the sixth seed right now. And as we talked about backstage, they're the sixth seed. They're going to play the Kings. If everything stays the way it stays, they play the Kings, who they just beat, 119 and 115. And here's the key to that win. The bench scored 35 points. The bench outscored the Kings bench. And I think that's always going to be their way to win these games down the stretch because you're going to have to create more. Like when you look at the really good Suns team, when you look at the really good Bucks team, it was always the bench. When you look at the Warriors, it was Jordan Poole. It was the bench. The bench is what gave them energy. And we talked about Austin Rivers not really uh, doing what we thought he would do. You talked about some of the other players on the bench early on. They're like, oh, I wish they would have kept so-and-so. Malik Beasley, I wish they would have kept you know, this guy because the bench was just so much better. Patrick Beverly, um, they didn't have any energy off the bench. Now, I think the bench is figured out. They got their five starters in there. And now the bench is starting to really come. You, you see Jordan McDaniels, uh, one of the non-big three, because you got Anthony Edwards, Carl Anthony Towns, and Rudy Gobert. When you have a non-big three guy have a big night, I think that's going to be the key. You know, uh, Jaden McDaniels, decent night. I think that's going to be the key for this team. You know, these guys have to find ways for other guys. Other guys have to be able to help them out because Anthony Edwards, I keep saying this, he's going to have to be the guy. You know, Rudy Gobert even, the funniest thing I saw was a clip of Rudy Gobert hitting that turnaround and the Kings bench getting pissed off, like, oh, I think he's hitting shots tonight. Like, like, <laughs> like if Rudy Gobert is getting his turn, you know, he did the little step, stop shoulder, like the Tim Duncan turn fadeaway jumper and made it. That's what they need. They need everybody hitting on all cylinders. Uh, but here's the key: they're only one game back from the five, which means if they beat, if they win, they got six games left. If they end up in the five, they play the Suns. And I and you said this: that's a scary place to be. Like, and I'm not saying anybody would tank to put themselves in a better position, but I know the Clippers would rather play the Kings. I know the Timberwolves would rather play the Kings. I know everybody would rather play the Kings than the Suns right now because the Suns, as before, without Kevin Durant, clearly a team you could deal with. With Kevin Durant, it's a tough guard. Like, that's a tough team to figure out because you can't throw four guys at two. Like, you are completely outnumbered. So you have to pick your poison. You know, do I man up Devin Booker with somebody like Anthony Edwards? Yes. For Kevin Durant, do I just send a double at him? Yes. And so now three on two, I got to figure out how to rotate with Rudy Gobert, 
be willing to let one of the bigs take a shot that doesn't shoot jumpers like DeAndre Ayton. Um, but that's going to be the key if you have to face the Suns. But that's just my take. I think the, the Timberwolves are in a great position right now. They're not in the play-in. Honestly, I don't think they want to be in the play-in because so much can happen there. Uh, when you just can sit back and watch the play-in, it also gives you a little bit of mental edge of like you're not exhausted because you waste a lot of energy trying to win that one game like they did last year and had a champagne, champagne celebration. You waste a lot of energy trying to win that play-in game. And so we saw how that wore on them last year. And then, of course, the Grizzlies put them out of their misery. Um, now if they're in there and they can beat the Kings, now we're talking. Now, because you never know what's going to happen with the rest of these teams. But I don't know, Sam, what do you think? Yeah, it just seems like six is the perfect place to be. You don't have to sweat the play-in. Mm -hmm. And you're clearly a bad matchup for the Kings. I mean, they've gone to Sacramento now twice in six weeks and one. And that's not something a lot of teams have done this year. And I think their size actually gives the Kings some issues. They're not nearly as big as Minnesota. Um, Timberwolves can score with Sacramento. I know Sacramento plays that up-tempo. Uh, they like to get in the paint. They've got a lot of guards that can slash and score around the rim. But the Timberwolves, they're, they're really establishing some depth here, Ron. If you look at the fourth quarter last night, um, no cat. Ant was playing about... 75 percent he's still hurting a little bit but i'm looking at the the rundown jalen noel tip shot Nas reed three-pointer rudy gobert makes free throws mike conley driving layup Jaden mcdaniels 10-foot shot like they're they're spreading the ball around everybody's contributing and it seems like they're really finding themselves so i i love where this team is at scoring wise they're really confident offensively and i think that that they they're in the king's heads a little bit right now so don't give me a, a healthy Suns team. Give me the Kings, who the Timberwolves just beat shorthanded. I, I like that matchup a lot more. Yeah, and I think that's the, the matchup everybody wants. Uh, again, six games left. It's really close. This is a really close race. Uh, anything can happen in the next six games. Again, the Warriors, the, the, like the Lakers could end up in the AFC. Like, we just don't know. You have no idea with the Pelicans, the Lakers, uh, the, the Clippers, even the Timberwolves, like all those bottom teams are within a game or two of each other and you only have six games left. So it's going to be a, a fun race to the end. I think this is what people wanted because a lot of people were annoyed by like, oh, this team's already clinched. This team's resting players getting ready for the playoffs. This team's already clinched number one seat. Like they don't want that. This is this is the one year East and West. I personally feel like there's not a dominant team. Like I feel like the Nuggets could easily lose to the Suns and probably will. I mean, to be honest, like I think the Suns can beat the Nuggets. And so this is the year where you really don't know. And so if there's any year too to put some money down on FanDuel, like this is it because you really just don't know game to game. Like the key is going to be whoever is hot. And, and I think it goes back to the bench. And that's why I like the Timberwolves bench. I think they are going to like be a big success. I think with the fact that those stars have been out, we've had Carl Anthony Towns out, you've had Anthony Edwards out, th those bench guys had to come in and actually be guys. And so now when you're asked to, like, you don't have as much pressure, you can come in and just carefree shoot. Like, hey, do your job, man. Like, Anthony Edwards is going to give us 30. Carl Anthony Towns is going to give us 25. Rudy Gobert is going to give us 12 and 12. Just come in and do your job. And I think that's why this team may be, maybe this could be the solution. We will see. But I still think, you know, again, you need another score. And that's why seeing the bench score 35 points, that's what Anthony Edwards needs. He needs to be able to take a breather and the team not miss a beat. Uh, but we got Deshaun Foster coming up in the Hang on Ron Johnson segment. Looking forward to hanging with my boy Deshaun, a uh, really good friend. We got drafted together, met him then. We stayed in contact over, over the years through social media, of course. It's been great. Um, every time I travel places, you know, like I, I try to reach out to guys now. Um, and so he's just one of them. And so the 2002 draft class, hang around Johnson, uh, I guess, trek continues. And uh, we'll have him coming up next. But before we do that, remember, we're a par partner with uh, Care 11. Just go to care11.com backslash locked on to get all of our videos, all of our shows right there on their site. And we have a word from our sponsors. We're presented today by FanDuel Sportsbook. It's America's number one sportsbook, and it's the official sports betting partner of Locked On. March Madness is headed to the final four. You can get in the action there. New customers get a no-sweat first bet, up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if that first bet doesn't win. Go to FanDuel.com slash Locked On to sign up today and claim your no-sweat first bet. Wager on everything, money lines, point totals, 
uh, which player is scoring 20 or more, uh, who's going to win the opening tip, all of that. Um, go on the app. It's safe, secure, super easy to use. Don't miss your shot at the no sweat first bet up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if the first bet doesn't win. FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. Make every moment more at FanDuel. Another one of our uh, 2002 uh, draft picks. We had Joey Harrington on recently, and now uh, we have Deshaun Foster. Got Jeremy Shockey coming up at some point as well. Um, so I want to thank you for joining me on the on the Ron Johnson show, man. And uh, Deshaun Foster, I remember meeting him. Uh, we were in California with the rookie premiere uh, guys from all across the country, 32 rookies, put in one spot, asked to hang out, take pictures. And, and honestly, man, it went off with a hitch. I talked to Josh McCown about it as well. Uh, who's now coaching as well uh, with the Panthers. And uh, it, just the stories I'm starting to remember, Julius Peppers, you know, he talked about, you know, his fake name at the at the lobby and uh, Antoine Randallel waking up super early in the morning and bothering everybody on the bus or we're trying to sleep. Uh, and and honestly, man, Deshaun Foster has been who he's been. Like, I remember Deshaun Foster being a quiet guy. But I don't know if you remember this. The, 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 the rookie premier team gave you the camera that was, like, broadcasted. And they okay. said, walk us through your uh, long run. And we'll we'll talk about the actual long run in okay. the uh, Daily Three. But you were the worst cameraman they've ever seen, I was told. <laughs> uh, because, <laughs> because you couldn't hold the camera straight. You was talking. It was swinging. People was getting motion. And I have forgot all about that until somebody else bought that up. Like, man, you remember Deshaun Foster's uh, video they let him shoot? <laughs> What was going through your head, man? Like, did you even realize they were going to keep taping that whole thing while you were holding a live camera? Yeah, I didn't think it was going to be like that. I'm thinking it was just some easy, small walk through through this real fast. We're just here at the Rose Bowl, and I happen to be playing here, so let's go. And that's it. But it turned into a bigger, bigger situation, I thought. <laughs> well, yeah, man, being back at the uh, – you know, talk about that. You know, you you got – we all got drafted, but you were back in the stadium – you had a lot of memories in uh what was that like you know being an nfl player but like kind of your start you know we took all of our pictures and our jerseys we got to see our our, our uniforms uh as rookies and that was kind of the unveiling to us uh what was that like for you though being back home it was fun because i had left to train and everything for the combine so i hadn't been back uh for a while you know i was just out there so getting back was kind of exciting just to be back in the Rose Bowl, then being with other athletes that have played at such a high level, it was just pretty exciting. Just because I think that might have been the first or the second one. I don't know if they yeah. did that before. You know what I'm saying? So it was just cool that they did something like that. Yeah, I think we were the second year because yeah, the year before I think like Freddie Mitchell, your guy yeah. from UCLA, and and they they had done one, and then yeah, we were the next group to kind of do it. And now it's kind of taking its own. It's a monster now because of social media and all the stuff they do and and nil and everything. But um, you know, looking at the scope of you know, UCLA versus USC, you know, in your your college time playing, you know, and this is Deshaun Foster, uh, former U UCLA running back, uh, got drafted to the Carolina Panthers, but you played at UCLA. And, and when you think about that, as far as like UCLA versus U USC, uh, what was that like in your time? That was a big time rivalry. You know, Carson Palmer was across the street at that time. Troy was over there. Uh, they had a lot of good players. So it was just good. Uh, we pretty much dominated the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> that was about an eight-game win streak in there. So it was just good that, uh, you know, we was holding it down, doing what we had to do, and beating on them boys. <laughs> <laughs> had to make sure you threw it in there. Eight straight was, wins yeah, over yeah, UCLA. Eight, eight, eight straight. straight. People, people forget that, you know. But <laughs> it was eight straight. And now you're headed to the Big Ten, you know, and, and so you're going to lose a lot of that pack uh 10 rivalry stuff you guys had before uh, a lot of those games fresno state some of those games out there on the west coast you guys have played now you're going to travel to penn state you're going to have to travel to minnesota you're going to travel to michigan michigan state ohio state um as a coach because you're you're a player so you remember those rivalries but now you're also a coach uh when you first heard that ucla and usc was going to the big 10 what what went through your mind um i was excited you know i'm the platform and the we need to play we need to play in situations where we can make it to the playoffs you know and we need to people need to see our game so we need that east coast exposure midwest exposure like we need that and I, so i'm excited for it you know when i was in school when we played the big 10 
what I think Ohio State came came out here. Oh one, we beat them. Michigan came in two thousand, we beat them. So I think uh, we're we're ready for that challenge. It's a it's a great conference. They're adding us and SC to it, and I think uh, you know things can take off from there. Yeah, man, because I had Spice Adams on, and I've had a lot of Big Ten guys on, and and some of the Big Ten, especially in Penn State. I mean, Penn State's far far east, so for them. They're not happy because they're like, we don't want to have to travel. We already got an East Coast schedule. We don't want to have to travel to the West Coast to go play UCLA or USC. Um, and so there's mixed emotions. There's other guys uh, within the Big Ten that, that like it. Joey Harrington bought up. He has no idea what's going to happen with Oregon. Uh, you know, and so you look at guys like Oregon, Oregon State, some of these other teams that might probably want to jump to the Big Ten. Stanford, you know, has hinted and want to come into the Big Ten. Um, but when you think about that, I, I love the the word exposure. When you talk about these players being able to be on the East Coast schedule, get more exposure, be seen on some nationally, you know, because Fox Sports and the Big Ten have a deal. So you're going to see, you know, the Fox Sports games, the the Big Ten, you know, everyday national games as well, uh, where USC, UCLA, people don't see them a lot until it's a primetime game. Uh, but before your players – uh, you know, what, what is that? Because everybody always tries to say the Big Ten is ground and pound or this, but like you said, 2000, you guys played Ohio State, you played Michigan as well, and you beat them. Uh, but when people try to act like ground and pound or whatever, that the Big Ten can dominate the Pac-12 or Pac-10, what, what is your thoughts going to that? And Because and, you're a running backs coach, and so you are dealing with the running backs. Uh, you know, do you see that being an issue, or has the game evolved so much that it's not like it used to be? It's not, it's not like it used to be. Not at all. I mean, we can just go back because we have a, a bowl game that is Pac-10 against Big Ten. Yeah. Then we can just go back through the history of it, how it's going, you know. So it's not a <laughs> – it's not a, a – con certain conference is playing a certain type of way. You know, right. everybody's running the rock, spreading it out a little bit, putting tight ends in there. You know, it's just certain identities of, of your team and how you play it. So I'm just looking forward to these challenges, you know. Uh, Seattle's far from LA, so we're 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 used to a long flight and getting up and having to play. So I'm not uh, okay. I'm not too worried about that. I just think guys need to you, you need that exposure if you want to be and get in the playoffs and and be top of the college football game. You gotta you gotta play certain teams and play certain games. So I'm ready for this uh, challenge. And how does that work now from a recruiting standpoint when you can tell kids like, hey, we're going to play on national TV against Ohio State, against Michigan, against Michigan State? Uh, because I know for UCLA, USC, Ohio State, and Michigan, that's kind of your your recruiting. Like that's your rivalry when it comes to recruiting, because a lot of Michigan, Ohio State, they're flying, especially Michigan. They're flying out to Cali. They're, they're trying to get those kids out of California over to Michigan. So now how does that help you guys with recruiting when kids are looking at like, well, man, Ohio State is always in the top four. Michigan's been in the top four the last couple of years. Uh, you know, and they're getting all this exposure on TV. Now, how do you use that uh, Fox Sports deal, I guess, with the Big Ten to kind of, you know, help that recruiting trail? Well, it helps now because it, it's tough to recruit the Midwest if you're not playing any games over there. Right. You know, it would have been hard for me to walk into your house and tell you, like, Ron, come out to California. You know, your parents ain't going to see no games. <laughs> Just playing Pac, you know what I mean? Playing Pac-10, yeah. Pac-12 games. But now that we're in there, it's going to be games against Minnesota. We'll be in the – Penn State will be in Ohio, be in Michigan. Like, they'll be able to come and see you play. So that'll help us with recruiting. We'll be able to recruit that area a little bit better. And um, like I said, like, it's a, it's a big challenge in all that aspects, like on the field, off the field. I'm just excited for it, you know. So, but I think that's going to help us because I play with a lot of guys that weren't necessarily from California. You know, some of our Hall of Famers, Jonathan Ogden, he's from uh, oh, yeah. Baltimore. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's just big that uh, – some of our top guys are necessarily from California. So it's not going to change our recruiting one bit, but it's just, it should help it. And when you look at you being a former player, now a coach uh, in that running back room, the position you played, um, you know, how often do your, your, your athletes try to, you know, one up you or say, Hey, like I'm, I'm breaking that record or, you know, or, or they just love to, you know, get the information from you because you've been there and you're, you've been to where they're trying to get to. It's a little bit of both. You know, my guys are competitive, so they most definitely. Like, I just had one in the draft that, that's in the, at the combine this year. He, his mission was to beat every – whatever I did there, he was going to beat it. You know, so it was <laughs> – and that's how he was talking to me about it. But, you know, we got a competitive um, environment, players and coaches. You know, we, we try to compete, get these guys ex excited and get them wanting to go. Um, my last four guys have gotten drafted, so, you know, they, they, they listen. That's the number one thing I always say about my guys. They listen. 
you know, they can take coaching. Just like they said, we, we've been in their situation and I really lean on that a lot in, in the coaching aspect and they take that. And I'm just happy that I have had guys that are able to take it and apply it on the field. And when you, when you travel around now, you know, when you look at all the cities you've been to, um, what what's a city that you really enjoy like going to to play and then what's a city now a new destination you're looking forward to going to um i want to play at michigan uh, okay we, we played them at home i played in the horseshoe before so i don't worry about that but uh and seattle it's, it's fun to play you do you know it's just just the the fans the, the environment you know it's just it's a just the way the stadium's built how it's kind of on top of you a little bit i miss that and what's the uh what's the reason for Michigan? Like what what is it about Michigan Stadium that you can't wait to see? I mean, it's just uh just what just what it is, I guess, you know. I I normally only see that game when I'm watching the Michigan Ohio State game. So it's yep. always a you know what I mean? So just the environment that I'm seeing, I I want to be a part of that. Yeah, 100,000 fans. I'll tell you this though, we played there a couple of times. It's quiet. It's not as okay, okay. like they're they're fans. They have older generational fans. I'll say that. Like it's gotcha. unless it's Michigan State. And again, UCLA Michigan might become a new rival because I know you guys have played each other before in bowl games and so that might become a new rivalry. Um I know in basketball Michigan UCLA is going to be a good one. Um mm -hmm. but you know, when you look at football, yeah, they're fans, they're old generational fans. So it takes a lot to get them out of their seats. Ohio State, Michigan State, for sure. Uh, so, so we'll, well see. I, just hope, yeah. I hope we don't get any whiteouts at Penn State. <laughs> I don't. I don't need that. Yeah, yeah that I, now that's a crazy one. That's a crazy one. That's right. that's one where you definitely because uh, we played them on homecoming and it's it's nuts. I will say that because there's nothing out there like in Happy Valley. Yeah. It's just Penn State, so you have nothing else to do on a Saturday afternoon but go watch football it's not like you know you're like in minneapolis you know you got the timberwolves you got the the vikings you got the yeah. wild for hockey mm -hmm. so they got the the full array here so it, it's tough to always get sellout games unless it's a big rivalry yeah. um but but for penn state yeah that wideout is the one yeah uh when you were drafted you were drafted the, to the panthers um you know what was that experience like you know going leading up to it and then finally coming off the board so that you could relax and say okay i'm, I'm good to go now I was excited. I was born in Charlotte. Both my parents went to high school out there. Uh, Pop was That's super time. random. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> went straight back home. It's crazy. <laughs> Before recruiting trips, the only time I've been on the plane was to fly back to Charlotte. Okay. You know what I mean? So that was the only place I've been. But um, <laughs> but <it's, laughs> my wife was like, "Yeah, you met your wife." But that's <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> so you met her in Charlotte, or yeah, yeah, I met her in Charlotte. Okay, cause yeah, cause I saw I saw your wedding deal. Like it was super secretive, but super exclusive. Like I saw magazines covering it. Um, I, I, I saw her, and this was the funniest thing. I, I love this because like my wife, I remember when we started dating when we were like in our twenty, like twenty, I think. And so we got married. When we were like 26, 27. I remember her asking me like three years into it, when are we getting married? And I, I think I said 26. And that's why I joke with her to this day. Like, I'm like, I think I just had that number. Like, let's give me some time. We got like, you took your time. Like you, you <laughs> took your time and she was with you the whole way. Like I got to give her props because there's not a lot of like, like, especially black women. Like there's not a lot of women that's going to stick around. Uh, while you try to figure it out, but you know, like you guys are are happy. You know, you, you took your time. You wanted to make sure it was right. Um, but but what was that like? Like was was waiting to get married more stressful or waiting for the draft? Like which one caused you a little bit more stress? I, I'm gonna go ahead and say married. I guess you know. <laughs> it was just, we broke up and then got okay. back together. So we did end up, you know. So that was the stressful part that we were separate, but. We got back together and we're here, so I'm excited. So you was on some like best man wedding stuff, like you was you was <laughs> you was out there like Tay Diggs, and you had to take your time to go wait for Nia Long to come, you know, to yeah. get back to you, and you right. know, you guys figured it out, but <laughs> mm -hmm. it made it. it, came back. But I'm glad for that though. You know? but yeah man like you but like the whole like the whole magazine covering the wedding thing and all mm -hmm. that like was there any stress or were you just like you know what i'm used to the bright lights i'm good with this i mean i really didn't know much about that okay because <laughs> we was i was still coaching that was a thursday i went to work that morning like there, there was a lot going on you know what i'm saying so i was so I was she did like, it all basically 
Okay, yeah. smart guy. You're smart, man. I'm gonna tell you this. Like this smartest thing you ever say in your life, man. If you if there's nothing else, <laughs> if there's no advice, because I know we're in our 20s, we can't give each other advice. I hate when I hear like these 17, 18 year old high school kids giving other kids advice to these 27 year olds. <laughs> I'm like, dude, stop giving each other advice. Y'all have no idea about life right now. But as a 42 year old man, I'll tell you that, man, because I got married at 26, 27. The smartest thing you ever did and will continue to do. My father in law always says this let her do it like whatever she wants to do just let her do it it's because <laughs> you know right. what i mean in the end it don't really matter like let her it do don't. it she'll be happy you'll be happy and life will keep moving on uh but i got Deshaun foster here uh former ucla running back uh carolina panther when you when you look at uh coaching now in, in this day and age with nil's uh, you just saw, you know, Miami for basketball. Everybody's saying they bought their final four run. Uh, money doesn't always win, Chad. Like, it doesn't always work out. Like, just because you have one player that's making 100000 or 800000 whatever it might be, it doesn't mean you're actually going to win. Uh, because when you look at Miami, they were not a top seed. They were the fifth seed in, in the deal. They weren't, like, a top seed, uh, which puts them right around top 25. But, you know, not what you expect when you think, okay, if I spend a hundred, you know, a million dollars on a couple players – uh, what am I going to get out of this? But in LA, it's huge. I mean, there's tons of companies. That's all you hear about now. How how have you guys navigated that, making sure uh, that players, you know, for you, because you know kids taking money, what can go wrong? How have you kind of helped them in that process when you hear a kid bring up NIL or whatever and 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 kind of assist them in like, hey, this is what you should do with your money. You know, this is what you shouldn't do. We're basically just trying to give them the resources and the tools to to function okay. basically you know so we just had a financial literacy course that they're taking um a lot of this stuff is doing player through our player development kevin jordan yep uh, played yeah so he's handling most of that stuff uh coach kelly's big on just making sure that the guys have the resources to to function and and navigate through this new world basically you know right. so um because they got to pay taxes they don't they think they just get money and <laughs> that's it. But you, guys, <laughs> not, you know, so you got to educate these guys. And our guys are doing a good job at that. And even the ones that know a little bit more, they're sharing with each other. But mm -hmm. it's just good to see guys are interested in it. So they want to learn, you know. And yeah, I think the tax the part earlier is better. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that on the NIL. Yeah. Like people are like, oh yeah, you just made a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, you owe the government twenty five of that. Like yes, you got to, you got to pay. They, and they want their money. <laughs> <laughs> they want their money. <laughs> You, know? you got to pay, buddy. Uh, you know, last two before we jump over to the daily three. That's three questions, three minutes each. Myself, Sam Mexham is going to join the show, and Deshaun Foster. Um, you're, I see you wearing the Jordan brand. You guys, I know out there, Nike and Jordan branded stuff. Uh, how how big was that when you when you found out that you guys were going to have access to the Jordan brand? I mean, that, that's huge. You know, with the, with today's kid, that's that's big. Coming from Under Armour, it was tough a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, just in the aspect of football cleats and you know basketball i think they were doing pretty well but with the football aspect it was just tough for us and a lot of kids didn't like that we were with that other brand but now that we're jordan they're excited they love it they all want to come to take photo shoots do all the stuff we got all the J's. so it's uh you know it's just good that that aspect is done we don't have to worry about that yeah, because I know Ron Bellamy over at Michigan, you know, he loves to post and send pictures to me of like his stuff he gets with Jordan. Yeah. Like how <laughs> how often do you get like new Jordan kicks, like as a coach? Every day I walk down there, if I got <laughs> some shoes, I got me some shoes. <laughs> if I go downstairs, there's something down there. There's something. <laughs> but it's they take care of it. They they, they do a great job. I I mean, um, I think when we first went Jordan, I, I wore Jordans for like two months straight. <laughs> just nonstop. Days. Just nonstop. <laughs> that was just straight for recruitment for the kids. You man, know? that's that's that is a that's a tough one, man. That's like there Jordan is a tough brand to recruit against. Like, cause I've seen, my hard. cousin went to Michigan. Like he was he committed to Michigan. So I, I I had to be a part of that. And I'm like, whatever, I get it. And then I saw the pictures and I'm like, yeah, I totally get it now. Um, yep. <laughs> you know, the, the, the gloves, the cleats, the I mean, the t shirts, the shorts, the sweatsuits. Yeah. It's like, yeah, man, it, it's my and what's crazy. And this is the last one, too. This, like, your players have never seen Michael Jordan actually play. Ever. Never. <laughs> 
like never like unless they no, go on I, youtube or something and no. they probably don't because it, it's not exciting to them to like sit no. there and watch a jordan game like when we were growing up no. but what 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 makes that brand or jordan himself still so sustainable is it just the trend that kids have learned from us because it was our generation like mm -hmm. that's what i try to tell people all the time like the 80s babies like we were the jordan brand like mm -hmm. we did it like we we yeah. lined up early before school started to get the jays yeah. when they released like yeah. we we had it we were wearing like jordans in warm-ups because i remember jamal lewis when we went to play atlanta atlanta falcons had the hard turf jamal lewis wore jordans for that game got fined he got fined but he wore Jordans for that game. Like we were the ones that started. And then Randy Moss did it. And then all of a sudden, Jordan's like, wait a minute. I need to get involved in this because these yeah, cats out I here wearing my shoe. Right. Yeah. These cats wearing my shoe and getting fined. Uh, but I'll never forget that. Like Jamal Lewis, uh, I forgot who else. I think it was like Jamal Lewis, Chester Taylor. Uh, it was a bunch of running backs that did it. And so they all like, man, let's wear Jordans, man. Let's do it. We, we you know, blah, blah. Coach, you know, we went in and they had the black pat leather joints. Yep. Our uniforms were were white and black that game, so they wore the and they got fined. Everybody got fined at Warm, but we did it. I didn't do it because I, I was I couldn't afford to get fined. But those dudes, <laughs> Jamal was a first rounder. He could do it. Like you go get fined, you take that peak slip. <laughs> I'm not getting fined. I'm gonna go back and put my regular Nikes on for this game. Right. <laughs> I'll warm up with y'all in the George, but I'm taking them off after this because I'm not getting fined. Back out. Yep. Right. I'm gonna pull but, but when you. Up. <laughs> but when your players have never actually seen Jordan play, but they all they do is talk about Jordan, like, do you ever try to educate them on that of Jordan versus Kobe versus LeBron? Like, you guys ever get in that argument? Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> they think LeBron is the best, and he is. There's nothing to against that. LeBron is, but they haven't seen Jordan. It's just it's, right. It's tough to argue that with them. It's a, it's a, but it's a daily conversation. Like, if you walk in some <laughs> of the, the rooms, you can see like top five basketball players up there. You know, because Kareem went to UCLA too, so we felt right. Kareem most definitely in there. You know, but it's uh, it's crazy because the kids just they don't associate Jordan with the player. That's the that's not. No, it's just a brand. It's, it's just a brand to them. You know, which is so crazy to me. Like, cause I don't I don't feel like, and again, maybe that's why he's the goat because I don't feel like, you know, Kobe played even though he passed away, but Kobe played his career out. I don't ever see like Kobe's clothing and shoes being transcended i don't see james harden i don't see lebron's even like when lebron's done i don't feel like people are going to still want lebron 20s like i just don't i don't see it happening like it, it just won't happen um you i don't wear think shoes ever... from 88 right shoe, you know what i mean the same shoe he hasn't made a new yeah. one it's the same, <laughs> shoe. <laughs> the same oh shoe. my goodness like i was literally just telling what we were just down in orlando florida at the nike outlet and i was just saying that to my wife because my daughter now she's turning 12 and all of a sudden now she you know she wants air max 270s she wants the the, the air max dunks the jordan yeah. ones and i'm like you don't even know what you're asking for and i was i was trying to explain it to my daughter i'm like do you do you even know my friends had them though they had the air force ones and then they had you know and so that's what today's kid does it's all about the trend they have no idea about michael jordan who he was um but man that's crazy man but and I lied, you know, just like any strength coach. One more before we jump into the daily three. Yeah. <laughs> um, and after, and after, of course, I always like the guests like to, to, to give some words of advice before they take off. So right when we're done, uh, I'll let Deshaun give like his last little bit of advice. Um, but I want to ask you a question though, too. When you look at now, you at the age of forty, what are you forty two, forty three? Forty three. Yeah. So at the age of forty three, because I'll be forty three this year too. Man, I'm feeling old. Uh, at the age of 43, when you look back on 23-year-old Deshaun Foster and then you look at these players, like, do you find yourself, and, and again, you know, you, you don't have to tell us everything, but do you find yourself trying to, like, tell these players the pitfalls? Like, hey, don't do this because I had a teammate that did this. Like, how how impactful have you been uh, to those players being able to tell them stories you've heard, players you've seen get arrested, make mistakes? x y and z at, at the school that's the number one thing really just trying to get ahead of stuff give them you know if i see something in a guy that i've seen in somebody else or an ex teammate just try to help them give them advice in just certain situations because that's that's basically the thing they're they're in college they're gonna fall you gotta you gotta catch them so i just try to make sure i'm, I'm there to catch these guys and and um just teaching the ropes you know good or bad 
And I was going to say, too, your boy, I forgot about your L.A. boy because he was, I just ran into him a while back at a game, Reggie Bush. Um, and when you think about Reggie Bush being in L.A. after, way after you, well, not too far after you, but after you, uh, running L.A., you know, running back out there. When you look at NILs now, because Reggie Bush just basically did what NIL is doing. And when you look at the NCAA and Charles Barkley and all these people now saying the, the NCAA is full of it, that you're now wanting to be involved because the new commissioner is a former governor. I forgot of where. Um, but he's or president, sorry, of NCAA. He was just on CBS uh, for the basketball deal. And he said, we need to get a group of people together to figure out how to govern this NIL. And so, of course, the NCAA knows, OK, we can't fight it. We got to come alongside of it and help it. But when you think about guys like Reggie Bush getting in trouble, uh, you know, other guys like, you know, uh, Terrell Pryor getting tattoos for tickets to games or tattoos for jerseys. And that's basically what these players are doing now. Do you think that it's time for the NCAA to, to, to let it go and just give Reggie Bush's Heisman back? Most definitely. Most definitely. Because that's just, if it's not, at the end of the day, these aren't crimes. They're not right. committing crimes, you know? So you, you, you can't hold it like that. If it's legal now, what, what they're doing, then you got to let them, let them get his Heisman and go from there. Yeah, no, true. It's not illegal. It's you took a couple of dollars here and there from a couple of companies that you had already at USC. It wasn't like it was a recruiting violation. He was already there. He became a superstar, and these companies wanted to come alongside him before he made it big. So it is what it is. I agree. I think it's time to give Reggie Bush's Heisman back. The NCAA needs to figure it out before they get left behind because eventually somebody like Jeff Bezos is going to create his own, and he's going to have a way to do it. That's why Snyder doesn't want him to buy the, the Washington Commanders because he knows – if Bezos gets his hand on the NFL, he's going to change it because <laughs> he has the money to do it. and He doesn't care, mm -hmm. you know, oh. and so I, I think that's going to be the key long term is, you know, because if I'm an owner and I can pay some of these players under the table and I got billions, I'm going to do it. And that's why I think they're trying to stop Jeff Bezos. But if he's smart, NCAA, that football and that basketball, there's a lot of money in that. He can get them to separate and just come to him, get all the regents and board. But, you know. That's down the road, down the road. Yeah, we'll end up having yeah. Amazon because then Amazon gets to run all the games, and then he really has a monopoly. And I know they don't want that. <laughs> For real, if, that, if, they, if he gets his hands on it, they all the Washington yes. Commanders games will be on Amazon Prime. Like yep, most definitely, yep. nobody, nobody wants that. <laughs> nobody wants to deal with that. <laughs> we got the daily three coming up next. That's three questions, three minutes each. Remember, people, you can download Locked On Sports Minnesota on Amazon Fire. Of course. And Roku. Uh, just go to your Amazon Fire, your Roku device, and just search Locked On Sports Minnesota. You'll find all of our shows right there on your TV. And we have a word from our sponsors. Thank you, Ron. Uh, let me tell you about the NFL Draft Buzz newsletter today. Authored by our own Luke Inman, you can subscribe at LockedOnPodcast.com slash newsletters. Get up to date with all the NFL Draft info, top five lists, everything going on in the NFL Draft world. That's NFL Draft Buzz. Subscribe today. Well, now it's time for the part of the show that I love the most. That's the Daily Three. That's three questions, three minutes each. We'll get to Sean most of the time, and I'll pick up where he left off. Take it away, Sam. All right, Deshaun, uh, I got a few here, and a couple of them focus on great accomplishments in your career, including this one. You did something that every player in their wildest dreams wants to do. You scored a touchdown in the Super Bowl. Take us through that moment. Take us through the play, what you did with the football, if you still have it. Take us through that moment. We were in a uh, tempo. You know, we were kind of in tip two minute. We called a red ball back then. So uh, he called a trap. I kind of just hit it. Broke out to the left. I went. I wanted to go around Smitty's block, but I kind of went in between Smitty and the defender. So they they, they kind of they ran into each other after I passed them, and then uh, it was a foot race after that. And then uh, then I was thinking I was about to get that Sports Illustrated <laughs> when I got in the end zone, but we didn't get that victory. So, um, but I still got the ball. It's a uh, it's upstairs in um in my little football area, you know. But right it was, on. Uh, yeah, but it was a two. It was a trap in two minutes. You know, it just hit. That's how we oh. actually got back in the game. We started going two minutes in that second half, and mm -hmm. that opened up for us because we couldn't we couldn't move the ball at all in the first half. Really underrated Super Bowl, right? I mean, I, I probably not the result you wanted, but as a fan, back and forth in that fourth quarter, that was wild. That's yeah, I was gonna say Jackson. that's Janet Jackson, right? There. Oh, yeah. was it? It was. Yeah. It sure was the Janet yeah. Jackson. Super that, Bowl. that overshadowed the game. So I was, gonna, I was gonna say when you guys came out though you didn't know what happened after no. half did you? No, not, not until later. No, 
Yep, yep, that's hilarious. <laughs> Because it's not like we saw it on social media or that. It was just like right, people exactly. Told you, your parents told you, or what? You know, it was like, oh, hey, this is what happened. I mean, I could imagine. <laughs> yeah. I could imagine, like, because because I was at like, so I haven't been to a Super Bowl in on the field, um, but like the Vikings had Ludacris perform at halftime, mm-hmm. and so as we're down under the tunnel, he's coming out as the players are coming out. And so, or yeah, he's walking off as the players are coming out. So I could only imagine like if Janet Jackson having to be walking off, you know, covering herself, and then you see see all these pellet players like walking by like wait what what what, what is going on out there like beyonce we sang the beyonce sang the national anthem man that was i forget yeah, that was low because i remember that was my rookie year i do remember that mm-hmm. and uh i remember even like madden i knew carolina had one of the better teams because that ended up being the team I used the most on Madden. And honestly, Steve Smith, like Steve Smith that year in the slot was nasty. Like it was so hard to figure out where he was going to be, how to stop him. And then of course, you know, the running game. Um, I don't remember your speed though, but I feel like they made you like, like really fast. Like that's the only thing I remember is like, (laughs) boy, I guess. huh? Because I do remember, like, yeah. me, Chester, Javon Hunter, uh, who else used to play? Jamal, Lewis, like, we used to do Bart yeah. Scott, like, we used to do, mm-hmm. like, Madden tournaments at my house, and I remember, like, I was always trying to flip the coin to get the Panthers, because I'm like, that yeah. that year, like, they made Steve Smith, like, a god in the slot, yeah, like, bro. you could yeah. not stop him in the slot, mm-hmm. so... Uh, that's why I tell people all the time too, because I, I met him when he came up here and he did the he covered the Vikings for the NFL Network, and I was yeah. telling other people around like, man, like people really don't understand how good Steve Smith really was, you know, like if because he, he was smaller, so he got you know what I mean he got knocked a little bit, but I don't think people really understand like him and Santana Moss for me were two of the best I've seen running routes, like it was unstoppable. We used to have alert calls on each run play, so if they was off Smitty, we'll yeah. just spit it out there. Yeah, I mean he that that he was that guy. Yeah, what you got next, Sam? <laughs> yeah, Deshaun, number two. I I would classify you as a dual threat running back. You can catch the football, run the football, and that's so important in today's game. What do you think separates the backs that are effective in the passing game versus those that aren't? I mean, you, you can just stay out there in certain situations. You know, when, when they can use you in a pass game, like Christian McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara, um, who else we got? Uh, Eckler in San Diego, you know, yep. when you can really get out in, in the pass game and and cause different matchups. That's 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 helping, especially if you got a good mind, uh, offensive coordinator or head coach or whoever's calling the play. So you know, if you can add that element to your game, you got to. Like I just try to tell my guys, you got to be all around back. You got to be able to pass protect. You got to be able to catch. You got to be able to run. If you can't do that, then you're you're cutting yourself short. But you need to be able to come out there and really have some sort of some sort of skill set that can cause mismatches and uh help offense <clears throat> yeah no i think that is key and uh, you know what i always got to do this on the show omaha got to call a little audible uh <laughs> had, had my boy clinton portis was on the show a while back and clinton mm-hmm. portis dropped a little nugget for us that went viral um he said if he could do it all over again some of these pass blocks like he said he remember having to block like stray hand <laughs> <laughs> he said he said like stray hand I uh, forgot the other name. I don't know if you remember, Sam, the other name he used, but I know Strahan was one of them. And he was like, you expect me to come up and stun Michael Strahan and then yeah. and then stay in the game and then go <laughs> run around and, like, go catch a ball. Like, I can't even get my yeah. shoulder. And he was saying how his shoulders hurt. So, so, like, if you could do that part of the game over again, and I know he was a little bit joking, but you know CP, he was dead serious mm-hmm. too, a little bit. Like he was like, mm-hmm. he was, he basically said, like, I'm sorry for my quarterbacks, but y'all already got sacked a little bit more if I knew what I know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like would you, or you know, same thing, like going out of bounds instead of fighting for two yards, he was like, he would have stepped out of bounds. Um, you know, w- when you think about the game like that too, are there such c- c- yeah. certain situations where you look at that too? Like, hey, I don't know if I needed to get that two extra yards, I might have just went down or gone out of bounds. If I could look back at it, I might have played safety. Just came right out and just played DB. <laughs> so now, now I can dictate what I want contact. Like today, I want to hit. Today, I don't. I just want to tackle guys, arm tackle. You know what I'm saying? But at running back, there was no. It was on every day. No matter if we, we playing, it's on. So I might have switched positions. But you know, was, <laughs> there's something about the, the touchdowns that you're addicted to. But true, a, a lot of schools were recruiting me to play DB, and I should have maybe, you know. Oh, I didn't realize you played safety. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah, you would have been a big safety. Yeah. <laughs> it might have worked. It might have worked out. But... <laughs> <laughs> All right, what you got next? That was the last one. All right. October 13th, 2001, Deshaun. Uh, taken on Washington. You rushed the ball 31 times, 301 yards, four touchdowns. Take take us through that day. What was working for you? Everything. It was. Uh, <laughs> it, it was. Um, I was just on that day, and it started early. It was a, like first two carries. You know, I was like, "Yeah, this is gonna be a good day." But um, I actually coached with uh, Jerry Newhouse. He's our receiver coach, and his dad was the head coach. Of the, Rick Newhouse was the head coach of Washington, so every time I play golf with him, he likes to let me know that I owe him some money because he got me drafted. <laughs> but <that's, laughs> but uh, it was just a, it was a good day. Um, we was running stretch, uh, power, inside zone, we ran a lot of stuff. Um, it was just it was just hit. At the end of the game, I think I, I broke like a ninety five yard run to, to to end it. But it was um, it was pretty exciting. It was a it was a big wow. game. It was. I think I might have had that. I, I I did pretty well against Washington throughout college, so it was, uh, it was good to see that I just I continued was able to continue to have success. That's crazy. That's that's mm-hmm. three hundred. How many carries was it, Sam? Thirty one. So about ten yards Man. a carry. Yeah, you was working that day. I'm about to say because October thirteenth, two thousand one. I had to look it up. I thought this was the day. That was the worst day of my life. We lost to Northwestern. <laughs> Oh. On a Hail Mary. Like, I've never, ever seen Hail Mary's work. And it was one of those where it got tipped out of the end zone. And then oh. Damian, I think it was Damian Anderson was the running back, caught it yep. and, like, just walked into the end zone. I'm like, knock the ball yep. down. And I was so pissed off because we had been telling our coach the whole game, if we come down to this moment, put the tall receivers in the game. Like, let us go in there and knock the ball down. He put three of the dumbest DBs we had on the team out there. <laughs> And all three of them are standing behind the receiver. We watched that tape so many times. And even our DB coach, who David Gibbs, who's now at a UCF, I just talked to him this week when I was in Orlando. And to this day, he was like, I still don't understand how all three of them ended up behind the one receiver they had out there. Like, and the dude just tipped the ball back to Damian Anderson. He catches it, walks in. And uh, yeah, we were the agony of defeat video on ESPN, like for the rest of that Man. month, like because our our three hundred and he had to be like three forty, I think, if you remember Sam Jake Cuppy, he was like six eight three forty, and he was in tears, and it was the it was funny now because we're like, dude, he's too big to be crying, but yeah. <laughs> so the day Deshaun Foster rushes for three hundred yards, we were we were picking up our tears off the Metrodome field because our DBs wow. just could not knock the ball down, and we lost. With a hell yep. freaking Mary. Because we're all sitting the there best. like, hell Marys never work. That's one of the best Northwestern teams, though, isn't it? Yeah, they were good that year. Yeah, they were that really the, That two year span of Pat Fitzgerald, because that's when Check With Me was created. So that whole, like, I hate, and I still hate it to this day. I think it, I think it hampers. That's why Northwestern quarterbacks never really play in the NFL because they don't know how to decipher the defense on their own because. There's a level of check with me, and then there's like, I'm going to do everything for you. And that's what Northwestern <laughs> does. Like, some check with me are just check with me, make sure the play is right, and then if you want to change, check it, check it. Northwestern completely at that era, now they probably change it, was like, I'm going to run this offense for you. Zach Kustak, I don't need you doing anything. Let me control this for you. And, uh, yeah, they were a really good team. They were a really good team yeah. then. And so we had them, though. We had them on the ropes. It was, I think, we were up 17-10, to 10, and then the fourth quarter they just – storm back tied it up and then instead of us keeping the ball and trying to run the clock out our coach three and out and then we're just praying like just stop them and nope Man. hail mary <laughs> we lose because we're just sitting back like let's get ready for overtime we got this nope they freaking converted to hail mary and uh ran out the stadium uh yeah it was the funniest part of that though was like they didn't have a lot of fans there so like they had like fans trying to run on the field <laughs> And it was like it was like forty of them. It was like forty fans. <laughs> ran on the field. I'm like, it's not like Alabama versus Ole Miss. Like y'all yeah, ain't that big. Like, it was like forty fans jumping over the Metrodome wall. Like man, get off the field. Like get out of here. Like get off the field. Oh, man. man, that was the worst day. One of the worst days of my life because I'm like, that's when I knew the Hail Mary actually could work. Uh, never right. worked for me though. But now I want to thank Deshaun Foster for joining me on the Ron Johnson Show, man. Really appreciate thank it. You. Congratulations to you and your wife. I did like because in the middle when we were scheduling this. 
I saw the picture. I'm like, dang, this dude just got married in the middle of like, like no, like no announcements, no, like it's coming. No, just all of a sudden, boom, magazine cover. Uh, but no, your your wife, man, you guys are a beautiful couple. Uh, but I always like to do this at the end of the show, man. I love to let the guests. Uh, back to the future was big when when we were growing up. So if you can go back to the future and give ten year old Deshaun, fifteen year old Deshaun, twenty three year old Deshaun or 42 year old Deshaun last year before you got married. If you can go back and give yourself any piece of advice uh, that could help you and others, you know, that were going through whatever you were going through or whatever, you know, you were heading to, uh, what would you go back and tell yourself? Just athletically, just mostly just take care of your body, you know, start getting massages and stuff earlier and getting a routine like that cold tub, hot tub, just stuff like that. Stuff you were doing in NFL that maybe just could have did in college. Just because you know you, you have more time and and just know the the recovery aspect of it, you know. So just knowing that now and that's 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 really it. Just um, take care of your body. You know, that's the number one thing I tell my guys: just take care of your body. So Man. put good things in it. Put good things in it, and and you'll be good results. <laughs> yeah, no, and that goes outside of sports too. Because man, there's a lot of mm -hmm. junk people can eat. Um, you know, I, I definitely appreciate my wife. She battled breast cancer back when she was 37 so real young to have to deal with it but you know after that like she was dead on about organic foods and eating right and vegetables and uh you know i i, I think i'm over peppers at this point because we eat so many peppers but you know i <laughs> i definitely appreciate it. i tell people all the time because people are like man what do you do i'm like i don't do anything like i don't really work out as much like i just eat right i'm like i don't put a yeah. lot of fast food in my body anymore like at all um, you know, even we were in on vacation in Orlando and, you know, she made sure we were getting baked chicken and rice and, you know, she, so I definitely appreciate that for her. Cause for our daughters, for sure. Uh, cause kids and eating healthy, man, like it's, it's one of those things that can either make or break you. And I don't think people yeah. realize that, but I want to thank Deshaun Foster for joining me on the Ron Johnson show. Uh, thank and you. everybody remember you can like download, share, comment, subscribe on YouTube to the Locked On Sports Minnesota app and get all the Ron Johnson shows, the football party with Arif Hassan, Luke Inman, Luke Bryan, and Sam Ekstrom. Uh, but I want to thank you guys and have a great day.